Goblin Stone is one that I've had on my wish list since 2021, and if I was better at planning and forethought, I would have a screenshot to prove it. But instead, here we are taking a look at the game, and I must say, this is going to be a bit of a different kind of video than what you're used to from me, because right now, over on the Steam side of things, Goblin Stone is currently sitting on some pretty mixed reviews, with a decent chunk of them there. It's not kind of like, you know, five or six dudes who didn't like it. There's a pretty good divide down the middle. And a lot of that comes down to just quality of life and small things within the game itself. Apologies past Beals, but future Beals are swinging in to take over this entire video because I have four hours of recording for this game and I simply cannot do it justice unless I start cutting things up and talking about all of the systems at play here because yes, the game is sitting on mixed, but I want to make sure I give this a thorough look in and give you all the reasons why some of those people are correct in what they're saying, but also why there's a lot of potential in this. So without further ado, let's get in. Now I'm going to apologize right from the start because I will be making some comparisons between Goblin Stone and Darkest Dungeon 1, and I normally hate doing that because I feel as though games should be judged and criticized based on their own merits and what they're doing right and doing wrong, as opposed to always comparing it to other stuff that came before it or that bears similarities. However, because of the incredibly niche nature of this subgenre of kind of like dungeon delving permadeath roguelite, you need to kind of make these comparisons because otherwise it's going to be very difficult to put in perspective the mistakes that I think Goblin Stone is making because long story short, the mixed reception might be justified, but let's get into it and find out why. First things first, the meat and potatoes, the bread and butter, combat. Now Goblin Stone is quite refreshing in this because they are not using columns or rows, there are no set positions, you don't have frontline tanks and backline support, they just have the queue, the line, and the line is law. The line is the world and everyone abides by this rule. And what I mean by that is that you have a literal whoever's in the front goes first system. We do have a timeline in the upper section of the screen that tells you in proper detail who gets to go in what order, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, so you'll always know who gets to go next and plan accordingly. A lot of good strategy involved right there. But Based on who's in the front of your line, that is who is literally going next. Once they take their turn, they move to the back of the line, and the line continues to cycle through, so you'll always get to kind of see visually and using the timeline at the top who's going to go next both on your team and your opponent's team. Now, this is both a good thing and a bad thing for strategy, it has its pros and cons, mainly being the pro is that you can kind of rig your own team composition to always have characters go in whatever order you want them to. So when you're back at your hub area and you're putting your team together, let's say hypothetically you've got a character with a stun ability. You could put him at the front, literally the leader of your crew and the main goblin that you control, and he's at the front of the line, and every time combat starts, he'll be the first goblin on your team to get a turn, so you can always start with a stunner. If you want to put a healer in the front, he'll always get a chance to go first, he can heal your team, he can buff, debuff, do whatever you want, put a warrior in the front, he'll do some damage, put a tank in the front, he'll start blocking. You get the idea. You build your composition based on like the domino effect. Who do you want to go first, second, third, fourth, and fifth? And you can plan that out. There are no speed stats, and there's there's a little bit less, although admittedly there's a little bit of RNG sometimes, but there's a lot less RNG with figuring out initial turn order. It's pretty cool. So you can kind of mix and match your team composition to kind of build different things like that. I didn't really kind of get into this and pick up on this for a little bit, but it's definitely very important when you want to plan ahead and have strategy based on who's in your team. Now, Combat is a little bit more deep in that, and sometimes a bit more RNG, because you might be thinking to yourself, oh, well, if you can always set up a certain rotation, then you'll always be able to go one, two, three, four, and knock everything over and win. Not quite, because they've gone ahead and thrown some more elements into combat to maybe compensate for that, and I don't know if it's necessarily a good thing or a bad thing, so bear with me here. One of the biggest complications you're going to run into are melee attacks, because let's say hypothetically you've got an opponent at the front of your enemy's line, and your goblins take some turns, and you whittle your opponent down to relatively low health, and you want to finish it off. But then that exact opponent takes their turn, and then runs to the back of their line. Now you've got a bunch of melee focus goblins that can't hit him until he gets back close to the front of the line again. So what inevitably ends up happening is you'll end up 
just by nature of the combat system itself, spreading damage around a little bit more between all of your enemies. So very particularly tanky enemies will take a little bit longer to bring down unless you have some focused dedicated DPS, like some ranged characters who can target them, whether that's stunning characters or the shamans who are able to cast actual range attacks. But you do have to still wait for those ranged characters to get to the front of the line before they can fire off attacks. This means that anything that can target back row or at the end of the line is kind of powerful and a little bit rare to come across because for the most part your most damaging abilities on the majority of your goblins are always melee attacks you know smack them with a sword hit them with your fist do whatever the shamans are kind of important because they do have those range attacks but even then they have a lot of the healing and support stuff so it's kind of a toss between what you want to do now you do have some abilities that can target outside of melee on melee characters but they're often utility things or damage over time like bleeds so don't be surprised if you're in the middle of combat and you've got an enemy wolf or a spider or something literally on like two or three health and you just want to hit it and it runs to the back of the line hiding behind a bunch of other bigger dudes now weak enemies running to the back of the line might seem like a problem but that also works in your favor because your goblins do the exact same thing to your opponents as well so your damage to your team will also kind of get spread throughout your roster unless you get stuck in a bad spot and i'll talk about that later but for the most part the theory is your goblins shouldn't all have all of the damage on one dude necessarily if you're playing it right. Now where the combat system does start to fall apart in my opinion is with each class's unique abilities. Now I'm gonna have to explain weapons really quick before I can get into this so bear with me. Now besides what class your goblins are the main way that you can customize them before battle is by giving them weapons. Peons which are the generic basic I don't have a job you know, type of goblin, they just punch with their fist. They always have the exact same abilities. They have a punch, a rock throw that stuns, and a shove that will push the enemy further back on their timeline and make them take longer to take their turn. That's just it. That's a peon, that's it. The other benefit that he gives you is he'll provide extra carry space for gathering loot while out doing your adventuring. That's the main reason to bring them, besides the stun. I think the stun is very, very strong. Now, the actual classes, like shamans, raiders, and guardsmen, have different abilities. The shamans have debuffs and buffs for your characters, like they can put a haste buff on and speed your dudes up. They can slow the enemies, they can heal your team, they can cast magical damage. That range damage I was telling you about, very useful. The raiders are your main frontline DPS. They bleed your opponents for damage over time. They do big, strong melee attacks and take care of the big guys at the front. But also you have the guardsmen, and they're admittedly I didn't use the guardsmen too much, but their whole shtick is blocking and defending your other goblins, so you kind of get the idea. Now, the problem is, all of these different classes can have four different abilities, and you can unlock more of them back at the hub, for a total of, I think, anywhere between eight to nine total abilities per class, but you can have four of them equipped at a time. And this is shared across all of that class. So if you hypothetically bring three raiders with you, you can't individually customize each goblin to have a particular moveset. You just decide all raiders get these four moves, and that's what all three of your raiders will have. But there's an extra caveat. So the weapon that you give your goblin will determine his basic attack. That one attack will always be there. For example, if you give your goblin a sword, the attack will have a chance to bleed enemies. If you give them a mace or an axe, your attack has a chance to sunder enemies and reduce their armor, making them take more damage. The same thing goes for shamans with their, with their range abilities. They'll have certain attacks based on whatever stick you give them. But the abilities, you'll only ever see two of them per turn. So let's say your raider walks up to the front of the line and it's his turn and he has a bleed ability, which inflicts a bleed on your opponent, and another ability that will do bonus damage to an opponent that is either stunned, frozen, or slowed, a debuff target. You'll do more damage to the weaker guy. And then the next time that same goblin makes it to the front of the line, he might have any combination, two, of the four main abilities that you've re registered the raiders to have. So last time he had a bleed and the bonus damage to stun dudes, now he has an ability that compounds on the bleed and will refresh the bleed duration and add a second bleed. But maybe he also has an execute type attack that will do big, big damage and effectively kill an enemy if they're weak enough and let you take another turn very quickly. Or if they don't kill the enemy, their turn gets put right back to the end of the line, kind of like a, you know, a double-edged sword. And every time you come to the front, you don't know what you're going to get. 
And because of that, it's incredibly difficult to plan combat because so many times things will go wrong. Now, let's say hypothetically, the opponent that you're trying to damage has armor. Now, armor will always reduce a flat number of damage from your physical attacks. The best way to get around them is to bleed your opponent or use magic attacks or some sort of status effect to kind of get around it. Or you could sunder them if you've got the right equipment for it. But typically, bleed is the good way to go. Or maybe you want to poison them or something like that. But what happens if your goblin gets to the front of the line, you've been waiting for this dude to get there, he's going to do an attack, and the bleed ability didn't show up. It's literally just picking two or four abilities, and if you didn't get the one you want, too bad. Let's say at the beginning of combat, you had your little peon dude throw a rock, which is what I like to do a lot of the time in the beginning of my playthrough. I kind of stopped doing this, but don't worry. He throws a rock and stuns a dude at the start. And then there is a wakey wakey move that your raiders can have, which, as I said before, does bonus damage to stunned or slowed targets. I'm setting up a stun, and then I want to beat him up and do a lot of damage. But then my raider walks to the front, and the wakey wakey ability isn't there. Now, if your goblin has at least five in a particular stat, which, mind you, isn't the stat that determines if he can be a good raider, it's a different stat entirely, you have an opportunity to re-roll your two randomly chosen class-based abilities, and you might get the one you want. But for the most part, your goblins are not going to have the option to re-roll this ability choice, and you'll have to just go with what you've got. So then let's say that stunned enemy is sitting there waiting to be hit with bonus damage, also happens to be an undead, which have a really high bleed resistance. You didn't get wakey wakey, you got the bleed attacks. That doesn't help you at all, so you just choose to do your weapon attack. Bang, you hit him. If you were using a sword that has a chance to bleed, I'm sorry, but you're just really using the wrong kit for this. Move to the back of the line and hope the next guy has the right ability and hope that the stun is still on the enemy. The amount of times this kind of thing happened to me is insane. It felt like I was flipping a coin every time I took a turn outside of the peon, because peons only have three moves. That's just the baseline they have. But every time someone got to the front of the line, it kind of changed things. And this is how it combats the whole setting up your team in a particular order to always be able to knock the dominoes down, because that's what I tried to do. Peon in the front, stun the first enemy, start hitting him with wakey wakeys, and you can probably kill him really quickly. If you get lucky enough, you can. You can just outright kill enemies very fast before they can get a turn. But let's say you want to put your shaman in the front of the team and have him cast haste, which effectively doubles or even triples the speed of your goblin, so they'll actually just skip ahead in the line and start taking their turns faster. But you put your shaman in the front, and he gets his turn at the start of combat, and he doesn't get haste. He gets a heal and then a damaging attack or something, and you're like, damn, well that kind of throws the plan out the window, so you have to start improvising. And when you have to start improvising, things go wrong. This is where they kind of introduce the random factor into combat. In games like Darkest Dungeon 1, the random factor came from missing your target, which sucked by the way, accuracy rating was terrible and we're all glad it's gone, or random crits. And you can still do random crits in Goblin Stone. Criticals do exist, but outright missing doesn't exist. It's not a thing, don't worry about that where you can effectively soft miss, in a sense, is with this random ability roll. You wanted to inflict a bleed, it didn't even show up, you don't even get a chance to try to bleed. Now, while a missed attack is just a wasted turn, technically you're still allowed to do something else. You can do a basic attack, you can do a different move, you're not really wasting your turn, you're just not getting to do what you wanted to do. Let's say you've got a goblin on really low life and your shaman walks up to the front and you think to yourself, oh, thank you, yes, I can cast a heal, and he didn't get a heal. You just don't get to cast a heal. You could cast a stun, uh, not a stun actually on a shaman, you could cast a slow or a haste and hopefully speed up another shaman to walk up to the front in time to save that death store goblin that's about to die, maybe, if you're lucky, but you know, if you just didn't get a heal, you're out of luck. Now, like I said, you can set up back at the hub all of the different abilities that your classes will share. So if you're really, really, really wanting heals to be done, put a lot of heals on your team so that they just always have at least one that they can use. If you put one heal on your shaman, you may never see it, or you might not see it for every like, two to three turns. But if you put three heals on there, you're now sacrificing utility and damage. It is a balancing act where you have to pick different abilities that complement each other based on the entire roster. For example, I told you that raiders, they can bleed an enemy, and then they have one called, you know, scratch the wound or something, where they 
refresh the duration of all the bleeds on the target and add an extra bleed stack. It's a very powerful bit of synergy. But let's say hypothetically you walk up to your opponent and you didn't get the initial bleed, you got the one that extends bleed duration. There's not even a bleed on the dude, so you can't even use that ability. So then you have to hope that one of the other abilities that you got instead are useful in that situation. But when it works out, i.e. Goblin 1 inflicts bleed, Goblin 2 compounds on that and makes a bigger, better bleed, then it all goes smooth and according to plan. But the RNG factor of abilities is always throwing a wrench in that system. Let's move over to the lair for a second. Now this is the main hub and where a lot of your permanent progression goes and where a lot of the major decisions are made, which can kind of screw you. So let me explain. This is all done as a series of caves and tunnels because goblins like to live underground. So all of the different rooms that you can construct connecting to each other are all of the different um, things that you can do effectively. So the war room is where you construct your team. You have a, a storeroom with all of your supplies, like your your sellables and your, your resources like wood and stone and iron and stuff like that. And then you have specialty rooms called guilds that are specifically there to teach goblins how to become certain jobs. Because, and I'm getting ahead of myself, at the surface up the top is where you recruit new goblins and all goblins that you recruit start as peons. Peons don't have a trade, they're just normal little dudes, they're not anything. And based on their stat distributions, this is kind of more forgiving than DD1, let me explain. Based on their stat distributions, you can teach a goblin to become something in particular. So let's say a goblin shows up at town, you hire him, and you decide, hmm, I'm kind of low on shamans, just make him a shaman. assuming. He has enough of the spirit stat. Now there are three stats that govern all of this. You've got ones that, you know, determine whether or not they can become certain classes, but more often than not, one of the goblins that shows up to town should be able to fulfill a certain role that you have. If you're familiar with one of the biggest issues in early game Darkest Dungeon 1 for a lot of players, it's healers. So let's say hypothetically in DD1, your Vestals have all died, you've got no healers, no occultists, no one who can do the job, you really want a Vestal, the new day starts, you go to the wagon, the stagecoach, there's no Vestals there, you're screwed, there's no healers, go do a dungeon run, you gotta waste a day, probably have some more dudes die before you can find a healer. Having healers on hand was always very important in that game. So effectively in Goblin Stone they've remedied one of the major issues there in that most of the goblins you find and can recruit can be kind of just given whatever role you want them to within some reason. There is still the chance their stats are too low to be a certain job, but they can always be other jobs instead, so you can kind of always have some wiggle room. There's also breeding, but I'll get into that later. Additionally, besides all of the guilds, you've got different places like retirement rooms, because some goblins can become injured or just you want to retire them and you want to get extra souls. Now, souls are kind of cute because when goblins die and they will die, you'll get souls. When they retire, you'll get souls. So the idea is character permanence doesn't really exist. And I'm going to go into that a little bit later, but that's that's a big deal. But basically, you'll get a resource for having your dudes die or retire. You can set up a little room for it. It's kind of cute. You can see little old goblins walking around. And you use those souls to continue to upgrade your main hall, so to speak, your main governing room that helps boost the majority of everything that you can do in your estate. So you kind of want dudes to die, and if they don't die and you retire them, I think you get more souls by retiring, so you're rewarded for keeping them alive long enough to retire, but you're still kind of thrown a bone if they die anyway. In addition to that, you've got various different things that you can do for upgrading, but they all require resources. And one of the biggest goddamn gripes I have is about the resources and a lot of people in the in the steam um review section are going to tell you the same thing the game becomes grindy I, I got less than two hours in and i felt like i was stuck because in order to build these special rooms you need your resources your wood your fiber your rocks your you know your things your leather that you go out and collect out when you do your runs and then you bring those back and you upgrade these are kind of like the crests and emblems and things from dd1 except there's no easy way to transfer between them, which DD1 did. That's one of the main comparisons here. If you had too many heirlooms, you could decrease and trade and transfer all of your different supplies so that even if you went out and you didn't get exactly what you needed, you could kind of get a little bit of what you needed by just trading them out. It was always at a deficit, but you could still get some. If you really goddamn need bones in this game, for example, to build a new building, and you've gone out on like three or four runs in a row and you didn't get any bones, tough, you just don't have any bones. Keep doing runs until you find bones. 
there's a merchant vendor that will show up each day that will have a random assortment of items, mostly weapons for your goblins to equip, but can also sell some of these things, but in incredibly short demand. So they might sell one or two of any given thing, and that's about it. So if you're looking to build some of these rooms and you don't have the resources, you're out of luck. And that is potentially very damning because you need these resources to build the guilds. Now, while you're out exploring doing your runs in the first place, you can come across trapped goblins. It's one of the special room types you can find, and you can free those goblins, and they'll come pre-built with a certain job affinity. You know, you might find a shaman that's trapped or a raider that's trapped, free them. You can add them to your party right there on the spot or send them back to the lair, and they'll wait for you if you need them in the future. But let's say You've recruited a bunch of squatter goblins waiting outside, and you want to make shamans. You need to make shamans, but you need to build the shaman guild in your little cave system. You don't have enough resources. You can't do it. So you've got to go and do runs before you can actually start building shamans, because I started making the room that lets you make raiders. I wanted to have a bleed team. I wanted my dudes to start bleeding and spreading dots and doing big damage. It's fine, I've got like one shaman in the back already, but then I wanted to make another shaman. I couldn't for the longest time because I could not get the damn resources I needed. The resource grind is potentially an issue if you don't plan for the future. If you just go willy-nilly spending your resources building different rooms that you don't need right now, like the retirement one maybe, or just certain things that, you know, you're building the guardsman you know, room, the guard guild, and you don't even really use them, so you know, you're just screwing yourself there because you need to build a shaman and a raider one, maybe. Plan accordingly for the future, and if you don't, which, why would you? You're a new player. You're going to end up screwing yourself and getting into a position where you're going to have to start farming resources, and it's not going to be easy to do. So next I want to talk about character permanence, because this one is either going to rub you the right way or really badly rub you the wrong way. And for me, I lean a little bit more on the wrong way side of things, but I can understand that I'm a little bit more forgiving. So let's talk about rooms. While doing your runs, you can find some really cool rooms that have different effects that benefit your party, but a lot of them are never permanent. So for example, if you find weapons out in your run, you can bring those weapons back. You can keep outfitting your goblins with the same weapon, as long as, you know, he didn't die with it or so, because I'm pretty sure if they die, you lose it. I, I think it's a bit weird because I've been losing weapons and I'm not entirely always sure how, but I'm going to get into that. Hang on. So if you find weapons and resources or supplies that you can sell, so you'll find, you know, armors and trinkets and little things to sell for gold. You'll also find your, your wood and your leather and stuff like that, or weapons. Those three things you can bring back permanently. However, while doing your runs, let's say, for example, you find a cool old teacher orc and he's going to upgrade your abilities for you. He'll bring up three abilities, you pick one and it becomes stronger. He'll do that three times over, you can make three abilities stronger randomly throughout your party for the rest of the run. Now, the benefit to this is if you pick an ability to upgrade and you have multiple of the same class, all of them are going to get that ability because that's just how the game works. And so if you have three raiders and you upgrade one of their bleeding abilities, you've now got three raiders that might be able to throw out improved bleeds. Very cool. But this is temporary. This only activates for that run. It's different to say DD1 where you have your characters individually upgrading their spells and abilities based on their overall level. You don't have the same level of permanence. That's an important thing to remember. The goblins are meant to die. They're going to die. Don't get attached to them, they are going to die. <laughs> now this also unfortunately bleeds over into weapons, which you don't have armor to give your goblins, the main ways to customize them are their class, the abilities you give them, how you order them in your, your team roster, and the weapon they've got. Those four things are the main ways that you're going to customize your loadout before each run. There is a blacksmith NPC, there is a blacksmith, and he can upgrade your weapon for you. Now, he, co he charges a little bit of gold, it's barely noticeable, it's the tiniest bit of gold. And this weapon upgrade is also temporary, it does not stay. But you can make your weapon stronger to do more damage for the run. And it has a success and a failure rate that increases incrementally as you upgrade anything. So you take your warrior's... your. So you take your warrior's cool sword, you drop it in, it has a 0% chance to fail, you hit the upgrade button, bam, plus one damage. Now it has a 10% chance to fail, okay, I'll do that, bam, you hit upgrade, it goes through, success. Now there's a 30% chance to fail, and you think, eh, I'll just lose gold if it goes wrong, that's the cost, right? You hit the roll, you go to upgrade, and it fails, right? 
Now, initially you think this is fine, it just failed. You can't do any more rolls after that. As soon as it fails once, that's it. But if you check your character, he still has a weapon equipped. It just didn't upgrade. Cool. If you finish your run and get out of the run, your weapon is gone. For whatever reason, failing this blacksmith roll will destroy the weapon once the run is done. It's like it weakens the weapon, it makes it brittle or frail, and then when your run is over, the weapon is gone. So if you've found a really good weapon that you want to use, this blacksmith, for a temporary upgrade, mind you, that will reset after each run regardless if it was a fail or a success, your weapon could just break. Considering that the pro is just a temporary buff and the con is you lose it forever, not worth it. Don't do it. I hate systems like this. You used to find them in a lot of like old school Korean MMOs and stuff like that with, you know, premium currencies to keep up like like Black Desert Online and shit like that, if you're aware. Upgrade the weapon. Whoops, you failed. It went down levels. Whoops, you failed. The weapon got destroyed. And the best way to get around that was you buy premium protection items from the shop for like five bucks a piece. I hate systems like this. It doesn't work. It's not fun. It's anti-fun. And for a single player game, where there is no reason to make it as grindy as possible because all it does is annoy the player, it doesn't work. In addition to that, I was talking about character permanence. Now, if you're familiar with DD1, maybe you're naming a character, you're treating them well, you want to keep them alive, and when your character dies, it's a blow to you because you've got this, let's say you've got a jester called Begingy, and you really like Begingy, and you want Begingy to live a long, happy life, but Begingy dies. You genuinely might be a bit cut up about that. There's like a very small chance to bring him back to life, but the whole gimmick is that he's gone and just not coming back. In Goblin Stone, it's worse than that. The goblins are like destined to disappear. They are meant to die. So this isn't necessarily a con if you don't care, but there is a couple of mechanics that can kind of just force it to happen, even if they don't really die, which I hate. So understandably, if a goblin dies, that's it. Over, gone, kaput. If you're looking to farm up the souls that you need, you can take a veteran goblin. Now the veteran status is awarded to a goblin if they go out and they do a run and they survive. If you retire a veteran goblin, you'll get more souls or you should get more souls than if they just died. If they die, you get one. If they retire, they might get like three. It's pretty damn good. This encourages you to cycle through goblins and train up new ones all the time. Just take a goblin, give him a class, Give him the piece of gear and he's basically already the same. Goblins don't have levels. You're not leveling up. A veteran goblin is effectively, as far as I know, the same as a new fresh goblin. It's just that their initial stat rolls might be different. Retire the guy, he's gone. But in combat, death store mechanic, right? If a goblin gets knocked down to one life effectively, they are mortally wounded. This will cut their max life in half. Permanently. Right? So even if that goblin makes it out of the dungeon alive and he didn't actually die, he was just on death's door effectively, but he survived. No matter what you do, that mortal wound is permanent. From what I understand, there is a very small chance you can find a shrine, which is a type of room in the run, and he can remove the mortally wounded buff from you. There may be more ways to remove this buff in the future that I'm not aware of because I'm only four hours in, but every single goblin so far that I've had that got mortally wounded, I go back to home with him and his life is cut in half. There is no reason to keep him. You are retiring him. So as soon as a goblin hits death's door, he is effectively dead. The best you can hope for is you will drag his ass out of there, save him Private Ryan style, and put him in a home and let him retire and you'll get some bonus souls for it. For some people, this is going to feel like shit because especially if you've just finished getting your, your shaman that you had to find while out doing a random run, and he hit that store in a run and now you got to retire him and you still haven't built the goddamn shaman place in your lair because you can't find any goddamn supplies. <laughs> I still can't make a Warrens. I want to breed. I've, I've literally not been able to find two more bones in the last five runs I've done. I want to make a Warrens. I can't, I can't make anything else. I can't make a, a guards guild. I can't make anywhere else to, to actually start making new things happen. I have to keep doing runs and hope that I can find those last bones or, oh, thank you. I'll just spend some money and buy the stuff I need. Right now I can make a warrens. Now to very quickly go back to combat and how turns are done. So there is a thing that can happen that I feel is the most negative so far 
in the way that the timeline system and the way that turns are done, and in particular, the way that the enemy AI works, because if they've only got melee attacks, guess who they're hitting? The dude up the front. And this has happened a couple of times where all of my goblins have taken their turns, they're on cooldown, they're waiting. If you're not aware, by the way, I probably haven't mentioned it already in the video, I'm not really sure if I have, but the different abilities that you have will have a number in the upper left corner of the actual ability itself, like from one to five kind of thing. And on the timeline, it will have numbers from 1 to 5 going all the way back. So the ability that you use will cost you more time before your goblin can act again. So if you use a big 5 cost move, your goblin can't do another action for a while. If he does like a 1 cost move, he can act more quickly. This is how they balance more powerful abilities versus weaker abilities. But let's just say that all of your goblins have taken turns and they're all waiting now. But all of your enemies who you've, you know, been fighting they're all going to take turns before you. Let's say that the first through fourth attacks in order are all of your enemies and not you. So in the situation where you go multiple times at the start of your of the fight and you get to kill a dude before he gets to fight, that same thing could happen to you in reverse. It, it, it just could happen to you where you have like four or five enemies take turns back to back to back to back and your goblin doesn't get a chance to take a turn and he just gets a train run on him. He just gets blown up. All of his health gone. He could outright die. I think I had one goblin actually just die that way. It wasn't on the first turn of the fight, but damn it felt kind of rough. And this mostly happens if you get a bunch of enemies all lined up that have uh, dominantly melee attacks and don't really do range. Or maybe they're just targeting the dude in the front because he's already been weakened by so many hits hitting him. It's something that's really difficult to plan around and you have to actually like go into the fight from the very beginning being very keenly aware that this could happen and plan accordingly with how you choose to space out your crowd control, space out your speed, penalties and buffs, what abilities you're using. You can just fall into a really shitty situation and someone's gonna die. This is why I was telling you, your goblins are meant to die technically. That's why I didn't bother naming any of mine or getting attached to any of them because I went through a number of goblins. At least in the four hours that I played, I think I had four or five goblins die and at least six or seven retired. It's kind of like, you know, touch and go with the survivability of these goblins. It just told me to upgrade the war room to level two so that when we start runs, we get a random blessing. And yet the requirements to do so are staggering. 30 wood and 30 bone. Let's go take a look at what kind of resources I have in my larder. So I have no bones. I still have no bones. Bones just don't exist. Look at this. Look at this. Bones and wood? How do you get bones and wood, dude? I have so much ore and stone. I have no fiber. No wood, no bones, leather is scarce. So getting this blessing to make runs a little bit easier. Ooh, that's going to take a minute. That's going to take a minute. But I am gradually upgrading some of the things. It's just, I feel like I'm hard stuck only a couple hours in where I can build spaces, but I can't build new actual, like, let me show you real quick. I'll, I'll put this here and all I can make is a quarter. I can't, I can't really do anything. I can't make the guards guild still. I, I can't really do much. Okay, enough negatives. How about some positives? So the art is gorgeous. The art team have knocked this out of the park. It is a fantastic game to look at. And I know the way that I'm going to end up editing this. It's going to be hard focusing on all the mechanical things. And there's going to be a lot of combat and the hub world stuff, but just the backgrounds and scenery is really really nice it's really pretty and the way that the story is being conveyed to you is through this like picture booky kind of like 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 old world scroll kind of drawing it's it's just got a lot of personality visually the game looks really really nice and it's it's quite impressive i'm glad that they've they've really nailed down a, a art style that's not trying to copy too many of the other things in this genre next let's talk about the narrator now in darkest dungeon everyone knows wayne the narrator he is the voice that you always think of whenever you think of those games he is the quintessential in your ear telling you what's going on and in goblin stone we have the same. We have a narrator who is doing a different take on it. He has a different kind of timbre to his voice. It's very rich. It's very nice. It sounds great on the ears. Totally the opposite of mine. It's a fantastic voice and I'm very jealous. He's got like one of those golden voices, you know? It's very, very rich and low, but not too harsh on the ears. It sounds so good and it works so well with the setting and this kind of pseudo fairy tale aesthetic. They happen upon a downtrodden orc still clad in rags and shackles at his feet. 
a freshly dug grave adorned with a bone club buried in the barrow. The goblins timorously disturb the orc in his mourning. Uneasily, they speak to him, ask about a nearby ruin in these woods. Barely noticing their presence, the orc wipes away a tear with one hand as he raises the other to give direction. Politely thanking the grieving orc, the goblins discreetly withdraw and leave him to his sorrow. He pops in not only to tell you about the story, but he also conveys, you know, flavor, flavor text here and there, like, you know, hitting the enemy with a crit, and when your dudes die, when you kill the enemies. It just, it's good, it adds personality. Now, in spite of the other things I've said, I do want to say that mechanically speaking, Goblin Stone is actually a lot easier to understand than Darkest Dungeon and a lot of the other games in this genre, because you don't have as much uh, piled onto you all at once. So the goblins don't level up, they don't individually require as much attention. So you don't have to worry about individual skills, individual armor, individual levels, uh, the, the quirk system where you've got to have pros and cons and, and stress making you melt down, all that kind of stuff. A lot of those things aren't present in this. It's very simple, clear-cut combat with some punishing mechanics here and there, and the customization is relatively simple and easy. Uh, the main part that I think has a lot of weight for complication is in the breeding system because you can breed goblins together and create baby goblins. This is how you're going to get your more advanced characters that are going to have exactly what you want because like I said, you can find squatters that are just randos that will show up each day so you're never really without potential goblins. But once you get the warrens built and can start breeding, <laughs> I eventually got there, you can start picking two goblins and based on their stats, based on their quirks, their attributes, things like that, and you can breed them together. And the game is quite generous. It'll even show you examples of who you can get, and it will breed, I think, initially two, but as you upgrade the warrens, you'll get more goblins each time they breed. It can only be done once a day, though, so you can't kind of, you know, infinitely start cycling through and start breeding dudes. They've got to rest, you know? They can't be just breeding constantly. But you can start making closer to your ideal type of goblin so that you can make better characters, right? It's it's mechanically a pretty simple game, and I think the breeding system is where a lot of the more uh, min-maxi element comes from. And even then, you don't really, I don't think, need to worry that much about it. It's just kind of there for the fun of it. Now, I do want to say all of the concepts and core mechanics are, at a baseline, good ideas. They're all good. They just need polish. Combat has its issues. It just needs polish. The hub area and the issue with trying to get resources to upgrade things, it just needs polish. There are little things that can be changed and adjusted throughout the cycle of development for the game as we continue to move forward, and the game, I have no doubt, will get better. The developers have been hard at work, there have been like three if not four patches within a week alone to address a lot of the major issues to deal with save file corruption and soft locking and stuff like that. The developers are hard at work and that is clear to see. Maybe you could argue it needed more time in the oven before it was being served out to the audience. Give it maybe another month or two and hopefully the game is in a much better state than it is right now in terms of the small quality of life things. I think as a whole, the game has a lot of potential to it and can easily turn around and go into an overwhelmingly positive state on Steam with the reviews. Right now, it's just a little bit too early. This video is mostly about pointing out certain areas that I've noticed that rubbed me the wrong way and evidently based on Steam have rubbed several other people the wrong way as well. We're not about punishing games that actually put in the effort. We're about, you know, helping these games to improve and giving the proper feedback that they need so that they can make decisions moving forward that are both good for them, good for the audience, good for the player base and better and more healthy for the game overall in the long run. So in closing, I want to apologize again for the fact that this isn't my usual video and it's turned into like this big talk about, you know, mechanics and system things instead of being what I would normally do, which is just hit record, play the game, and go, ooh, ah, and explore things from the start. But before I knew it, I'd play the game for four hours, which in its own sense is a good thing. The game was able to keep me involved for four hours before I realized and went, ooh, damn, I better stop the recording and start actually making a video. But there's no way I could condense all of that down because I learned enough in those four hours that I had to make this kind of video to properly explain instead of giving you guys a false impression with, say, like a 40 to 50 minute video where I say, nah, the game is good, the game is fine, because I hadn't run into too much of the stuff by that point. But with all of that said and done, I've got to get out of here. My voice is starting to die. I've been back on stream over on Twitch. Come hang out if you want. Dragon's Dogma 2 coming out. Big hype. We're going to play that over the weekend. But yeah, with all of that said and done, i got to get out of here. I hope you guys have enjoyed, and I will see you all again next time. Have a good one.